Okay, um, first of all, I want to say thanks to the organizers for putting together such a rich and thought-provoking conference. Um, the organizers gave me the suggestion that maybe my title should be a bit shorter. <laughs> and so it's not just a harem for the Pasha, which I think is a good editing suggestion. Um, so I'm going to tell a bit of a savory story today. It's partly an attempt to reconstruct the document where this going to started in 2008. And it's an attempt partly to situate these within a framework of post-colonialism and post-feminism. Um, I apologize in advance if I quote a little too much, but some of the uh, sources were a little bit too rich not to repeat verbatim. Okay, so um, the paper is divided into four parts. So the first part is anche le belle donne costano molto. Ever since Berlusconi's initial rise to the public arena, women have been for him a metaphor for his ruthless style of laissez-faire capitalism. In his first television interview with Enzo Biaggi in 1986, he deflected questions about the legality of his private television channel and the millions he had invested in the project by stating, Il mio è un affare di cuore. When Biaggi interrupted to say, un affare di cuore di qualche miliardo, Berlusconi replied smugly, anche le belle donne costano molto. In the Berlusconi symbolic economy, women are accessories to a masculinity that is con configured under capitalist principles. But as we have seen, women are also able to enter into these transactions and to take this game of women as commodities and play it to their advantage in terms of both power and wealth. The game is not just vertical, but seems to allow for two-dimensional participation by numerous actors and actresses. In this paper, I'm going to discuss how such an open network of play, where women are transacted but also transact themselves in a system of patronage and power, had an unlikely participant, Moammar Gaddafi, and how one of the last chapters of the Berlusconi era crystallized this system. At the height of the Rubygate scandal, a figure from Italy's colonial past emerged, seeming to give currency to the idea of an oriental parent, but in fact suggesting that Berlusconi had succeeded in resurrecting himself as Italy's postmodern Pasha. The Berlusconi era seemed, on the one hand, to direct itself toward actual women, sorry, to direct itself less toward actual women than the means to buy them. Throughout the Berlusconi epoch, it was not Berlusconi's intrinsic sex appeal that enabled him to be surrounded by hundreds of beautiful women, but his ability to pay them greater or lesser amounts of money. In reality, the Berlusconi personality preyed on this perversion of the idea of the Don Juan with an failing masculine charm. He was achieving constant success in sex without any evident sex appeal. Numerous compromising photographs and incidents consistently emphasized Berlusconi's low height, etc., such as when he famously appeared wearing a headscarf to cover up a recent hair transplant, which is an image I'll return to. These skepticals that underscored the Cavaliere's decidedly unattractive side were clearly moments of deliberate self-fashioning. By representing himself as unappealing, Berlusconi seemed to be highlighting what was a more important fact. That is, that he had succeeded in substituting, or at the very least in combining, desire for a woman with a fetish for the market economy. In the Berlusconi world, women were not merely objectified, they were the signposts for money and power. Yet furthermore, after this swap, could we even say that in the Berlusconi era, women become sort of derivatives for a cleavage of money and power? They were then circulated and exchanged on an open market and formed the stock, as it were, for the power relations between men. But now I'm going to turn to Libya. One of the most significant policy developments of Berlusconi's third term was the court signed in 2008 with Muammar Gaddafi. The so-called Friendship Treaty was ostensibly built to normalize relations between Italy and its former colony and to create a fiscal and energy alliance that might result in greater prosperity for both nations. In a prototypically Berlusconi gesture, however, the agreement plagiarize human rights language so as to advance an agenda of greater independence from the strictures and ideals, principles of Europe. Built as a, quote, humanitarian gesture toward Libya, Italy planned to fund
Lebanon $5 billion into Libya over 20 years of business investments that were supposedly, quote, reparations for the colonial past. As a scholar Claudia Gazzini has pointed out, the treaty's language belies any authentic definition of reparations, which are in the current use of the concept most often issued to persons, for example, uh, reparations have been made to Holocaust survivors or to injured groups, but not in the form of business investments to sovereign nations. Moreover, the treaty participates in the noted amnesia of the colon Italian colonial past, connected to the lack of inquiry into the into Italian colonialism in the aftermath of the Second World War. As Gazzini notes, quote, the treaty's stated aim to close a painful chapter of the past stands contrary to the goals of reparation politics. Furthering historical inquiry should go hand in hand with the process of settling past disputes, end quote. And that these reparations, quite to the contrary of acknowledging the painful legacy of Italy's colonial past, which saw over 100,000 Libyans killed, the treaty is tantamount, or was tantamount, to buying the Libyan silence. Calling such an act a friendship treaty seems rather an endorsement of the Italiani brava gente myth, that is a symptom of Italy's lack of decolonization, as well as its inability to come fully to terms with its fascist past. Nevertheless, Berlusconi made the grandiose claim to have embarked on a new chapter and to steal this deal that was historical first in both Italy and in Europe. For indeed, no other European country has come up with such a financial package to a former colony. The treaty concealed some widely criticized policies. The provisions for immigration um, of the treaty made it possible to police the Mediterranean Sea and to launch a crackdown on African migrants seeking to arrive in Europe. As critics noted at the time, the treaty essentially allowed Italy to outsource its harshest, harshest anti-immigration tactics to Libya, where human rights abuses were virtually impossible to monitor and stymie. Images of African migrants being delivered to the edge of the Sahara and ultimately their deaths shocked human rights groups. A more significant portion of the treaty was dedicated to the issue of securing a gas and oil supply for Italy. The companies Enne and Berlusconi's own Finivest were significant shareholders that have gained from the agreement. Likewise, Libyan investments have powered the Italian financial sector, and it is estimated that Libya had major shares in Unicredit, Italy's largest bank. Thus, the Friendship Treaty was in reality a fiscal and strategic alliance, as Gaddafi himself was later to point out, one that even included a non-aggression pact. This made it less ne later necessary that Italy effectively dissolve the treaty in order to back NATO intervention as a no fly zone in Libya. The Friendship Treaty inaugurated anything but normal relations between the two countries. Rather, it engendered a series of spectacular visits by Gaddafi to Rome that the Italian media preyed upon as if it were the embodiment of the zeitgeist of the Berlusconi era. On his first arrival in June 2009, Gaddafi arrived with a provocation, wearing pinned to his breast a photo of the Libyan resistance leader under Italian colonial rule, Omar al-Mukhtar, which the colonel described as the equivalent of your cross. This appearance of Gaddafi, one of his first trips to the West since sanctions against Libya had been lifted, was indeed something of a figuration of the return of Italy's repressed colonial past. But after pitching his Bedouin tent in the Villa Doria Pamphili, Gaddafi promptly called upon the Minister of Equal Opportunities, none other than Mara Campania, to arrange for him an audience of 700 women in the business sector to hear a speech on the role of women in Islam. However, the source of most fascination by the media during Gaddafi's visit was his arrival at Champino, surrounded by this cabaret of all female bodyguards. The Italian press nicknamed these women the Amazons. The Amazons, of course, resonated with the sex scandals that were involving Berlusconi at this time. They were just one more sign that Berlusconi was attuned to primitive forces that could transform him into, some, into a kind of pasha. In November of that year, Gaddafi returned, this, play, this time placing a request for the casting agency called Hostess Web. As stated on their site, Hostess Web purports to provide, quote, solo hostess, o personale qualificato e non qualificato, ma decisamente serio. Gaddafi requested that 200 women might receive him in a villa outside of Rome. Those who responded to the call were promised a 
sum of 60 euros. To fit the bill, they needed to be at least 1 meter 70 and dressed in elegant but sober attire. A journalist for Fonsa News Agency that went undercover to the event reported the surreal scene that ensued. Dentro l'atmosfera e la harm, sotto fondo di musica araba e temperatura surriscaldata, è una corridatrice dell'agenzia che impartisce lezioni di comportamento. Appena lui entra, alzarsi, applaudire, sorridere, alzarsi, applaudire, sorridere. Il colonnello ci chiede di rivolgere delle domande e quando una delle ragazze si alza in piedi e per orrore lo chiama presidente, lui rimane in silenzio. Al suo posto parla il ministro che gli fa da traduttore. Lui non è il presidente, lui è il leader. After learning that Gaddafi went on to lecture, uh, uh, sorry. The Gaddafi encouraged the gathered women to convert, distributing his gifts copies of the Quran in his green book that was the foundational text of his 1969 revolution. The apology of the evening was his final exhortation to the women that they should become Libyan brides. Io e l'amico Berlusconi vogliamo emergere i nostri due popoli. Questo vuol dire che i nostri uomini verranno in Italia e che voi andrete in Libia. Siete disposti ad andare in Libia? As Lomele of Ansa described, she felt a bit like one of the Sabina women before the rape. In effect, Gaddafi's words were disturbingly reminiscent of the rhetoric of empire of Mussolini, who once traveled to Tripoli to announce that he had become the, quote, protector of Islam. It's interesting to reflect that in reappropriating an image of empire presented by Mussolini, which is often rhetorically billed as one face, one race, Gaddafi seemed to be assuming the prerogative of Berlusconi to in uneasy ways recall Mussolini. But by the same token, one might argue, what Gaddafi was in some sense attempting was to enter into the Berlusconi theater and to use its symbolic transactions to his own fame and notoriety in much the same way that so many of his showgirls and players were doing throughout the Berlusconi era. A further sad but revealing irony to this episode was that several of the women in attendance expressed their disappointment about the reception. It had failed to live up to their expectations. A Quran was hardly a pair of diamond earrings. Neanche l'acqua, complained one. Rhetorical speeches, however imperial, paled in comparison to one of Berlusconi's parties, which arguably were enactments of the real thing, a Bacchus that celebrates the invisible power dynamics of contemporary life in its capitalist empires. Gaddafi was free to play the game, but he was clearly just a sideshow, and like any side act, it needed to become more and more outrageous to hold the attention of its spectators. In August 2010, when Gaddafi returned, he again used the service host to sweat, this time ordering a reception of 500 women. During the event, he claimed to convert three women in attendance on the spot to Islam, stating to the crowd, l'Islam dovrebbe diventare la religione di Europa, drawing criticism from the Vatican, but also attracting much attention from Italians as they trickled back to the city from their August holidays. One journalist justifiably gave the event the headline, è arrivato in Italia il Gaddafi show. Gaddafi soon after attempted to put his words where his mouth was and organized a, quote, romance tour for Italian women to visit Libya, attempting to, to play matchmaker between young Italian women and his nephews. And in fact, there are several of the Bellina that are quite well known for having had relationships with uh, Gaddafi nephews and sons. In the media's depiction of these Gaddafi visits, it became unclear who was the real author of them. Had Gaddafi been inspired by Berlusconi? Quote, Gaddafi has clearly been learning from the Italian prime minister, wrote a British journalist. Or was it the other way around? Berlusconi and Gaddafi were so close that rumor has it that the bunga bunga, an erotic ritual practiced by the Italian prime minister, was introduced directly from the colonel's harem, suppose one researcher at a policy institute. In March 2010, 
Italy and the rest of the world watched in dismay as Berlusconi kissed the knuckles of Gaddafi in a public meeting in what a journalist for the New York Times aptly called a godfather moment. Critics wondered if the gesture did not very well reflect in Italy's enormous debt to Italy for its energy supply. Was Italy falling into the hands of Libya? A few critics rather mistakenly wondered. What I want to focus on, however, is the way that this ambiguity of authorship reveals a larger issue of how the Berlusconi culture was operating, apparently gaining much momentum through these symbolic transactions of power. Gaddafi emerging from the wings as Berlusconi's willing doppelganger was a stroke of genius for Berlusconi in his quest to, fa his quest to fashion himself as Sultan of Italy and other of Europe. And one can only but presume that Berlusconi was the real author of these events insofar as it must have been suggested to Gaddafi that he used a site called Hostess Web. Close ties to Gaddafi seem to shore up this image of Berlusconi as an indefinable pasha. If Tony Blair was afraid to be seen with Berlusconi wearing a headscarf, then Silvio had finally found his rightful match with Gaddafi. All of this was a very careful construction. The image of Gaddafi at his side, pitching his video in tent and bringing his Amazons and caravan to Rome, was perhaps the most clear example yet that Berlusconi had not only a monopoly of ownership of the media, but had monopolized the media's morbid fascination. It showed even more fundamentally that his theater had penetrated to the deepest levels of his government and was also shaping foreign policy, potentially changing key Italian alliances since the end of fascism in World War II. Thankfully, the farcical romance between Gaddafi and Berlusconi that began in 2008 with the signing of the Friendship Treaty was to come to an end. It was, however, an especially uncanny ending with the twin downfall of the two leaders in the fall of 2011, when both fell from power and how they did not depart from one another. As I conclude this paper, I would like to speculate for a minute on whether we can view this coincidental disappearance as really a pure coincidence. By spring 2011, it became clear that Italy would have to dissolve the so-called friendship treaty and the non-aggression clause within it to maintain a fundamental alliance with NATO, which by this time was debating whether to support the enactment of the no-fly zone. Foreign Minister Franco Frattini alleged that Gaddafi had been retaliating against Berlusconi's lack of support in the face of NATO hostility by opening the floodgates of migration. Hundreds of African migrants arrived on the islands of Lampedusa, telling aid workers that the price of passage across the Mediterranean Sea had significantly dropped, and that they had met little opposition at the port when boarding. But in reality, the Libyan leader was to make one final attempt to persuade Berlusconi not to abandon their pride promise of lifelong friendship. He sent a missive to Berlusconi reproaching him for, betray for the betrayal. The French magazine that broke the story reported that in the, word, in the letter, the word friendship had been crossed out and replaced with the word alliance. The most incredible part of the story, however, was that the messenger was not a diplomat, not even an agent of the Italian Secret Service, but none other than Alessandro Lodero, director of Hostess Web. Thus, in Gaddafi's final months, as he became surrounded by rebels and a growing recognition of NATO intervention, in what was recalled, what will be recalled, a highly controversial NATO intervention that have, some have said came premature, prematurely before diplomatic sanctions were given a chance to take effect. It was absurdly Berlusconi's harem of hostesses that was to provide the colonel with his last link to the Italian premier and arguably to the West. This, I want to argue, is a sign of both the strange means by which power relationships were consolidated by Berlusconi, as, with, as well as the way in which Berlusconi's symbolic economy came dangerously close to being totally indistinguishable from the real economy. In the classic model of home social order, as theorized by Eve Sedgwick, women are, with, are the currency between men and solidify the bonds between men and the patriarchal order. Moreover, while it may seem that in many moments these exchanges and transactions were ironized, in fact, it, they concealed a sort of Ponzi scheme of kickback strategic alliances and unsustainable promises of friendship and privilege. 
Well, Gorilla Stone, at least in public, never appears to have responded to, to the colonel's lone cry from the desert. He did express in public his regret about it, and that he'd even considered resigning over the issue. It was as if, we can only speculate, that the narcissist was losing part of himself. Yet, I'm not just suggesting that the history of Berlusconi's foil is great material for a film for Oliver Stone. I think, rather, it's indicative of how the Berlusconi era, era could only but end in such a dramatic and farcical way. Gaddafi's audacious comment that Libya should perform a kind of re reverse colonialism and that Libyan men should travel to Italy to take home Italian brides, in an unsettling way, seems prescient of Berlusconi's own downfall. For in the end game, it was almost as if Berlusconi had been colonized by his own mad creation. The political theater that he had presided over as a true mago for almost two decades had finally had enough of him. The sex scandals and the last successes of the Pasha had set the stage for the final act. Although it was to be the real economy that sent Berlusconi out of power, it was all that was needed to spell the end of this symbolic economy of patriarchy, as Italy had finally grown weary of the Berlusconi show. Thank you, Valerie. Our second speaker is uh, Cosetta Gaudenzi. Cosetta is associate professor and uh, head of the Italian University of Memphis. She has published extensively on um, various topics like the use of Dalit in the cinema, the reception of in Italian uh, literature. Her most recent publication is on uh, Mazzaforati's La Giusta di Stanza. Today's talk is called Post-Feminist and Post-Colonialism in Contemporary, Post-Feminism, excuse me, Post-Colonialism in Contemporary Italian Cinema, The Case of the Escort in Massimiliano Bruno's 